Hello everyone and welcome back to Gage Hill Crafts. I'm your host Sarah and as promised this episode is going to feature the things that I made in my pottery class um, which took place during January and February of 2020. Um, so fortunately I was able to finish that class and get all my pots back before um, quarantine period set in. It was a fun class. Um, there's definitely some you know things I would have liked to see done differently. Um, but it was a good return to ceramics for me. Uh, I had taken a couple of pottery classes in college and hadn't touched it since, so, you know, 20 years later. Um, just wanted to try it again and, 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 you know, see what clicked with me, what I enjoyed about it, um, and maybe explore some techniques that I wasn't familiar with. And it certainly did all those things. Um, so a big thank you to Third Branch Pottery in uh, Randolph, Vermont, for you know, hosting classes and making your facilities available. Um, if you are in the central Vermont kind of area, um, and particularly if you have small children, um, the Third Branch Pottery, when they reopen uh, for in-person events, they um, teach a lot of classes for little kids. And so if you're looking for a creative outlet or if your children are interested in, in ceramics, um, it would definitely be a great place uh, you know, great opportunity to take them, and the classes are very affordable, um, at least I think so. So, without further ado, I will show you what I made. Um, and this was sort of maybe five and a half class sessions or six class sessions, depending on how you counted it. Um, there was a week that I that had to be canceled because of snow, and then I didn't do the makeup day, but I had stayed late on other days. So I sort of feel like I got my my complete coursework done, my, I got my full, um, you know, involvement in the class, um, was fulfilled. So, um, it was cool. And we did some cool stuff. Um, I think probably the favorite thing that I made was the first thing that we made. Um, and my instructor started us off with the idea of making nesting bowls. I'm, I'm reaching for them because they're right here, but I'll actually tell you about the technique first and then show them. So this was a course um, that was just called a hand building. And ostensibly we were gonna learn different kinds of hand building techniques like um, slab building where you roll out a sheet of clay and then you form it into different shapes. Um, coil where you make little rope like snake things and then um, build them up to, to make a form. Um, and also pinch pots where you, you take a glob of clay and you manipulate it with your hands into a shape. Um, but we didn't do coil or pinch. We just kind of stuck with slab um, for the six weeks. And and that was fine. I got a lot out of the class. Um, we spent a lot of time on decorating techniques and glazes, um, sort of more time on that than, than form building. Um, you know, so so that's, that's what I'm going to show you is a bunch of slab made things um, today. So, like I said, my favorite thing that I made was a set of nesting bowls. And the way these worked um, was that we rolled out slabs of clay. We used some kind of textured device, either a textured like roller or a piece of silicone that had a texture in it that we pressed down into the clay. Um, then we used uh, fluted pie plates. Um, to cut out the pieces so you can see each of these has this fluted ridge on the edge. Um, they're not just straight, they're, bump they're bumpy and fluted like the edge of, of a pie. Um, from there we cut, um, using a template, we cut corners so you end up with a round piece of flat clay and then you trim corners and fold everything up and um, then use little patches to kind of fill in these corners and make it more structurally sound. And the tricky thing with this kind of a, a project is that you're having to prop up the sides to keep them up while all the clay is trying to dry and while the corners are, you know, setting up and sticking to themselves. So that was a little fiddly. Um, and a little hair raising. <laughs> uh, we did all four of these in one evening and got them got them into shape and then allowed them to dry 
Um, we use toilet paper rolls as our props. Um, toilet paper rolls wrapped in plastic. So that works because they were the right sort of shape and depth between the edge of this and then the tabletop. Um, and you can see here, so I'll just walk through. So this one had, I used like a, a florist's, um, what do you call those? It's like texture balls of dried vine. Um, you'll see them in like home deck kind of areas. Um, they're just meant to be decorative, but actually pressing those down into the clay, you get these random um, stripes. It looks like you pushed twigs into the clay, which is what it what it is. And then this was a, a stamp um, that I rolled onto here. That's got kind of a flower and leaf theme. I was going for an organic set with this set of nesting bowls. Here we have swirls. Uh, on a teal glaze. This is probably my single favorite piece um, for the color, the size, the way the glaze turned out. Uh, on the back we have fish scales, which is really cool. It looks really great in the blue. Um, I almost wish I'd done that differently and put the put the fish scales on the inside and the swirls on the outside, but that's okay. Uh, this was like a basket weave pattern on this side, and then again fish scales on the outside. Um, and this was a I can't remember if it's called like robin's egg or something. It's sort of a celadon green. There's some yellowy gold undertones to it when the when the glaze breaks. Um, so I like that color, but the inside is a little thick and it's hard to see the pattern. And then the largest one um, was a pretty big disappointment. So the outside is swirls. You can see those. The inside, I intended this to look like wood, and you can see it just a little tiny bit here. This kind of wood grain thing going on. Um, but the glaze ended up being way too thick. It was, you can tell um, that this is a very different kind of glaze than this, because this is shiny, and this is more matte. Um, the These were kind of house glazes for the whole studio. Um, that are commonly used, these shiny ones. And then my instructor, I told her I wanted kind of a, a you know, a brown wood color, like a rich wood color for this largest vessel. And so she gave me this glaze, but it was mixed to a different thickness and I didn't realize that. So it's, it's pretty heavy. Um, you can even see close up, there's this pitting that happens when the glaze is so thick that it's kind of just boiling in the kiln and it's getting bubbles. And then those bubbles pop and you end up with this kind of pitted look. It's just because the glaze is, is too thick and it's it's pooling up also because it's also running down the sides of the vessel and into the corners um, while it's being fired. And it was so thick on the outside it ran over and actually fused onto the kiln. So I'm going to have to get some kind of uh, probably like a rotary cutter power tool and you know grind this down and make it smooth. Um, and maybe make it look a little bit better. There's also a big like drip in progress here. This one didn't actually fuse to the kiln, but it's, you know, it sticks out. So that was a bit of a bummer, but you know, you can still see the wood grain. The color's nice, and I think as a set they look pretty good. Um, the other funny thing, <laughs> you can tell, this is not round. It's, it's racked and warped um, just from the way that it was set up. Uh, I didn't have like a nice square form that I could put this on, so the whole thing's kind of oblong and funky, which means um, that this bowl does not nest perfectly inside of that one. So it, it will go in, you know, I can get it in there, but it sort of hangs suspended inside that one rather than sitting all the way down into it. Um, eh, you know. I'm a beginner, okay? All my pottery looks like it was made by a beginner. That's okay. Um, but you know, it's a cute little set and I think it's it's serviceable. These were all food grade glazes. Everything I made was food grade. So, you know, you could have your, I don't know, one kind of cracker in here, you know, or pieces of bread. And then you could have like some sliced something to go with the bread and then maybe some kind of spread in here or maybe like a little dip, like olive oil or something in here, you know. So nesting bowls, you know, or put out just like a variety of different snacks um, in each one for a, for a buffet style party treat. Um, you know, I, 
I think these are one of the more usable items also that I made. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. I might keep these for myself. Um, I should say that I'm, I'm probably going to need to rehome some of the things I made because I don't really have a use for everything. And I'm thinking about doing that in the form of a giveaway. Um, I'll probably give away some other stuff too. But we've recently reached over 400 subscribers on the YouTube channel, um, including a bump in subscribership during um, you know, February and March and April when we weren't posting very much. So I really appreciate people signing up and subscribing even though um, we were a bit AWOL at that point. So thank you all. Um, and yeah, you know, we have 400 people here. We have almost 900. We've been hovering in the, the 890s over on our Instagram feed, um, which is another way that I interact with a lot of you. Um, and so I think when we hit 900 on Instagram, um, we'll, we'll do a giveaway and we'll, I'll, you know, I'll post about it here um, and also over on Instagram as well, at Gage of Crafts. So stay tuned for that. Um, so back to the things that we were making. So that was all week one. Week two, um, we made vases. And again, this is a slab type construction. So we rolled out a long piece of clay that was big enough to wrap around and make into a cylinder. Um, and we joined, we joined it. I don't know if you can see uh, in here. I'm gonna be able to show that to you, but you can see I have an overlap and a big seam down here. Um, and that was you know, an interesting challenge to try to get get down in there and get everything seamed up and sealed up. And then on the bottom, we just kind of, well, this was an open cylinder, and so we kind of pinched everything together and slowly wedged and worked this down into a stable form. And so this is a vase, and it does you know, sit up on a table like that. And I decided to go for, again, kind of an organic... Um, shape. I know at one point um, my instructor was helping me and then you know someone else in the class was like oh it looks like a little so imagine this wasn't here it was just like a red you know body um, it looks like a little dude with like two little legs and a little pot belly you know <laughs> and they're like you should you know you should make it into a little like gnome or something um, and that was a cute idea you know I'm sure that would have worked I, I really wanted to do this leaf idea so what I did was I carved out all of these leaf shapes and relief, leaf, relief leaves, <laughs> um, and then scratched into the surface with a tool to create more leaves. So the idea is it's supposed to be like vines, you know, coming up and then being like a cluster of, of leaves up here. Um, and then you can see it's got a, a terracotta um, clay body that we used on, on these they were all a white clay a white stoneware so this is a red stoneware body you can see the color inside here um, and so then that dried and I decided to go over it with so if, I guess first um, first what I did was I did the green wash the green underglaze then I did this carving um, so then I had a bunch of red lines here and then I painted over the entire thing in a very thin coat of overglaze which was a celadon and so you can't it just looks kind of shiny on the the green underglaze areas but you can see in these cracks here or these um, etched lines it's kind of an olive green so the celadon plus red clay gave me an olive color and I like that um, you know, again, it fits in with my organic thing. There you can see the difference between the celadon color and then the, the body, the clay body right there. And also there's Leo. Leo. Um, it's freezing cold today, so I, I did put the fire on for everybody just, you know, for an, an ambient touch. Um, <laughs> it's very cold outside, very windy too. Um, so yeah, there's my vase. Um, it weighs about 10 pounds. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's very chunky. Um, our instructor had us working with incredibly thick slabs, and I, I understand why, because if you have a thin slab, it can get floppy and it can be very difficult to actually get it into a shape that you want. So for a beginner, you know, thicker slabs are better. Um, you know, is this elegant? Is it, is it dainty? Definitely not. Um, this would be something that you could use for home protection, you know, club somebody over the head with it if they... <laughs> 
came into your house. I don't know. Um, you know, so it is what it is, and it looks like a beginner person made it, but I'm happy with the glaze. I think I think that looks cool. I think my, my sort of concept um, turned out. You know, I was able to execute what I was thinking of. Um, so there that is. Um, let's see what's next. So then the next week we were doing sort of platters and I showed you in the last video, I showed you one of the items that I had made, which was that round moon plate. Um, and then these items that I'll show you are, are the same technique. Um, so you roll out a slab and then decorate it with this stain. In this case, it was a bright turquoise. So I picked this color, um, because it was one of three options for the day. Um, there was the black, there was this, and there was sort of sports team purple, you know, that, that kind of intense grape color. Um, and that goes with my decor even, even less than this does. So, um, it was kind of cool. You know, I got kind of a sky theme going with this. So I decided to use little like cookie cutters to do stars in different, different sizes. Um, and then we rolled, after we had done the stain and cut out our, our designs, we used a roller to kind of distort the design. So you'll see that like these stars on this one look kind of stretched out. Um, and you can even see some area where some of the stain like lifted up so you get these stripes. Um, and that was my only complaint I think about this technique was that I would have rather not done the distortion because um, pressing down on the wet clay that's been decorated with the stain, when you lift up your tool that you're pressing with, some of that stain came off on the tool and it kind of messed up the design, um, made it less distinct in some areas and also lifted off some of the stain in places. So this was not one of my favorite techniques. I think it would have been fine if we hadn't tried to like distort these designs, but I understand what my instructor was going for you know she was trying to like show that you could do some kind of decoration and then change it um, after the fact so a good learning experience but not one I would recommend um, so once these were bisque fired I just dipped them into a clear like ceiling glaze so you can see this is very shiny um, but that was just to you know preserve the design and not cover up any of the elements um, so this is a set of two and you know one kind of small one medium um both sort of this organic leaf shape and there you go blue with stars um the following week we got into a more elaborate construction method and we each had to make a bo make a box and believe it or not this took three hours just to to you know create the design cut out the pieces and then stick it all together. Um, because if you have a cube, then you have to have six pieces that are all the same size um, and you have to get them lined up and you have to kind of work on these edges um, while the clay is malleable in order to get, you know, nice edges and get everything joined well um, between the different pieces of clay. So that was, you know, very, very intensive experience um, and our instructor you know had to provide a lot of support for us um, again working with incredibly thick uh, clay there's my finger for reference so this is more than a quarter inch thick um, even after being fired and you know firing will shrink um, <clears throat> shrink your piece down a bit um, I chose, this was red clay again, um, I chose this kind of cherry blossom. It reminds me of like a Chinese um, stylized cherry blossom that I've seen in other decorative arts. Um, and got a really nice pressing. I'm very pleased with the texture that I was able to get and it goes all the way around this box. Um, and then once the box was like leather hard, we were able to cut the lid off. So you end up with just a sealed cube. Um, and then you have to kind of decide how you're going to glaze it and cut it. And again, I was going for like an organic kind of a shape. So it's not, it's not straight across. It um, undulates, but it, it sort of goes in and out and between some of the 
texture elements here, especially this side, you know, it sort of dips down to accommodate what the texture is doing so that it doesn't, um, so that it like adds to the overall effect rather than taking away from it or competing with it. Um, so that was an interesting thing. And then glazing, um, and as you can see, it probably just looks clear. I was trying to do like a plum sort of a glaze on this, um, and you can see it in a few places. So you can see it like in, in the cracks here. I don't know if you can see this is like a little bit pink. Uh, it's really hard to see. Maybe there you can get an idea. Um, but you can see it's almost undifferentiated except for the fact that it's shiny. It's basically the same color as the raw clay body. Um, and that's not the effect I was going for, but you know, you work with what you're told you have to do. You work with the materials you're given, the techniques you're given. Um, if I had been allowed to do this, what I would have done was dunked this rather than painting the glaze on so that I could get glaze on on this surface here and um, then painted this entire lid, including here, and then gla and then fired this on stilts um, in the kiln so it wouldn't stick to the bottom of the kiln. Um, but they didn't have stilts, they didn't let me do that, so you know, I did the best job I could. Um, I was also warned like not to put this on too thick um, to avoid that dripping problem that you saw on my other pot because especially here, if you have too much glaze on the lid, it will run down and then it will get in here and then it will seal your box shut and you, you won't be able to get your lid off. So I understand all those precautions, but it means I went really, really light on the glaze and, you know, if this were a white clay body, you'd be able to see that color a little bit, but on this it just sort of looks unfinished and vaguely shiny. You know, again, sort of a mixed result. I do like the form of this a lot, and I just, I like this texture a great deal. Um, but, eh, it's okay, it's a box. Um, again, it probably weighs 15 pounds. It's so chunky and heavy. Uh, you could fit some jewelry in there, some odds and ends. I don't know, my husband sleeps with earplugs. You could like keep a little stash of earplugs next to the bed or something. I don't know, it's a box. Okay, um, so that was most of what I made. The final piece um, was a hybrid build and we actually got to use the wheel a little bit. This is, like I said, this was a hand building class, but um, we had talked about making casseroles. My instructor brought, brought in these cute um, casserole dishes that looked like different kinds of vegetables. And the way that you make these um, is that you throw just an empty ring on the wheel. So it's, it's a form that does not have a bottom, like a plate or a bowl would. Um, when you're throwing, you go all the way down uh, onto the wheel itself to make a hollow cylinder. Then you take that off of the wheel um, you have to have a slab uh, of clay ready, and then you carefully put this um, ring or cylinder that you've made onto your slab and then cut out uh, the slab, you know, kind of form the ring in the shape you want and then cut out the slab to match. And then you have to marry the wall uh, cylinder form onto the, the bottom piece and then make a lid. Um, so the idea is this is a, you know, a covered dish um, that you could uh, bake something in um, or a serving dish for like, soup or something like that. Um, so my, um, and my friend uh, Angela Tong, A Tong Designs, um, she had made some beautiful casseroles uh, on, uh, she's a more experienced potter. Um, and she'd made some beautiful casserole dishes using a similar technique. And so we were kind of chatting back and forth. Um, it took me forever to get this out of the bisque and get it glazed. Um, and so I hadn't been able to show her uh, what it looks like. Um, but the form I was going for was a pear. And I will show you. 
the final product. Ta-da! There's my little pear casserole. There's the side. And so this is the, this band all the way around here is what we threw on the wheel. And then you can see mine's not round, it's pear-shaped, you know, it's ovoid. So um, while the clay was still wet and malleable, I stuck it onto the bottom and um, you know formed it in so it's like it got this little indent on this one side and then once I had the side and the bottom all married up and shaped the way I wanted then I was able to roll out another slab and create a lid um, for this and um, you know they dried together and then when they were leather hard I went back and I did some extra shaping to make sure that the lid would you know really sit down um, into the little channel on the top you can see there's a ridge here and so the lid has to sit on this lip um, to keep it from either falling in or or sticking out and creating an air gap there so I'm very pleased with the shape um, it's not the most practical casserole because there's no real handle for it there's this little stem here which my <laughs> my instructor kept saying make it smaller make it shorter it's gonna fall off it's gonna break off you know, you're not going to be able to keep your stem. You know, make it, make it as small as you can. So I made it a little stubbly, stubbly stemlet. I even um, took the time to texture that a little bit, and then uh, painted it with an under a brown underglaze to make it very stem-like. Um, then it was bisfired, and then it was time to glaze it. And before I picked what glaze I wanted, I really wanted it to look, you know, as naturally pear-like as I could. So I did a another of these kind of leaf plates. This was a test of glazes. Um, and I could have just done some like plain strips of pottery, um, but I really wanted to make another usable item. So I made another leaf shaped plate. I really, I love leaves and I love leafy organic shapes. Um, and this, if you can tell, is actually four different glazes. So underneath we have one that's kind of a, a darker gray brown. Then we have this lighter tan. And then over the top we had like an ochre yellow. I think the, the term for this was bone. But it's really a kind of a yellow color. Um, kind of lighter than an Anjou pear, but in that same vein, a golden, golden yellow. And then this green. Um, and what I liked uh, was basically this half. For that those pear kind of colors so the the brown with the yellow on on top for the inside of the casserole right because I wanted it to look like you'd cut into the pear and that was the inside of the pear flesh and then the um, you know light tan or I think that was called mouse brown or something um, that color with the green over top for this pear color now on the plate what I did was I dipped the glaze. And so you can see the glaze kind of came and it spread out and it had like a nice even, especially here, um, it just had a nice even tone and I was very pleased. I got all excited when I saw this. So then I went back and I, okay, same thing. You don't want to put too much glaze on the lid because it'll run and it'll stick your lid, will permanently fuse onto the body of your piece. You won't be able to get your lid off or use your thing. So I said, okay, I'll brush it on. You know, I'll thin down these glazes and I'll brush it on. Well, look what happened. Ugly brush strokes. Um, and all, and kind of globby, you know, globs of color. Um, so glaze-wise, this is not at all what I wanted this to look like. Um, Rick was very kind when I showed him. He's like, oh, that looks great. You know, before I said anything, of course, everybody's their own worst critic. And so we're always like saying like, oh, well, you know, I wanted it to look like this and I didn't like the blah, blah, blah aspect of it. You know, it's fine. Again, I'm a beginner. Um, I've learned a bit from this. Um, I know that if I had dipped both of these, um, you know, two layers of glaze in the thickness that they were given to me, they would have been too thick because look what happened on the bottom of my test plate. Um, it had so many drips and up here it had a drip that was so big and so stuck on that the, they actually had to like chisel it off the bottom of the kiln and they took a huge divot out of 
out of the bottom of the plate. So this would have been too thick. I would have had a serious problem. This ended up being too thin and I needed to kind of find that middle ground. Um, but it's, it, it's hard with pottery. You don't, there's no assurance that you're going to get the effect that you want until you practice and practice and practice and can um, kind of scientifically replicate um, every step in the construction process. And that just wasn't what this class was about. You know, they weren't giving us that many tries, that many materials um, to do something or that much time to kind of go back and say, okay, well, that didn't work. Um, let me try again. So, you know, if I did take another pottery class, I'd probably keep trying to refine this kind of an idea with a casserole and like a natural um, color that would emulate the object. Um, but again, you know, beginner potter, not bad, totally functional piece. Um, it is recognizable as a pair. I think if I handed this to you and it's like, hey, what does this remind you of? You'd be like, oh, it's definitely a pair, right? Uh, maybe it's an avocado. I don't know. <laughs> it is kind of green. An avocado that's going bad. Um, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's cute, you know. It's cute, and I'll probably make something like uh, a pear crumble or something and serve it in this at our next dinner party it would be kind of fun, right? Uh, when we can have dinner parties again. <laughs> so, so that's kind of cute. Um, and again, I'm not, I'm not trying to like be hard on myself, like, oh, I should have done better or something. It's like, no, I'm a, I'm a beginner. And in each of these things, um, you know, I learned a lot. I, I gained some experience. Um, and and that was kind of the point of this class was not to be perfect at everything, but to just get your hands in there, literally get dirty with clay and practice and, you know, see how to work with these materials um, and see what kind of effects you can get. I just, I, I try not to always go into projects like this, but I often have an end result very clearly in my mind. And when things don't turn out the way that I planned them, um, you know, it, it, it can get a little frustrating or or even just, you know, you look at something and you go, yeah, that turned out fine, but it doesn't look like what I had in mind, you know, and it's kind of hard to let go of that. Um, I've had that experience with knitting. I've had that experience with spinning fiber. I've had that experience with dyeing yarn. Um, so it's not exclusive to pottery. I think the thing with pottery is that there's no going back, you know, once it's fired, once it's... Um, once it's decorated, you know, there's very little undo uh, functionality with this medium. And so and then you get locked into something that you're not totally happy with and that you can't fix. Um, and that can be frustrating. Um, I, I certainly don't consider myself a perfectionist, but I do consider myself kind of a positive idealist. And so, um, you know, when things that when there's too big of a gap between what I had in mind and how something turned out. I can get a little deflated, but, but that's okay. Um, again, it was fun. Um, I am very glad I did it. I will definitely keep a few of my pieces and, um, who knows, maybe I'll take another pottery class in a couple years when the bug, uh, when the bug bites me again. Um, that would be a lot of fun. So, um, if you, uh, do pottery or ceramics, um, I know there's, you know, there's a certain amount of overlap um, between people who do fiber arts and people who do this. Uh, I would love to know, you know, just what, what kinds of things do you make? What kind of techniques do you use? Uh, what's your favorite technique or, or what's, a, what's a form or, or shape that you've been working on lately? Um, feel free to share in the comments below. And um, also, you know, if you're interested in pottery classes, um, it's not really something that you can do uh, in an online format, um, unfortunately. So during this pandemic um, outbreak period that we're in right now, you're not going to be able to probably take a pottery class. Um, but I still encourage you to look for a pottery studio in your area if you're interested and, you know, go ahead and sign up on their mailing list and then you'll know um, when they're offering workshops again and when they're, they're reopened. Um, of course, if you were really dedicated, you could um, there are ways to build kilns or, or buy kilns for home use, and so you could certainly set up a whole studio on your own, but um, you're talking about several thousand dollars worth of investment to get going, so that's probably not like, 
oh, I'll just try this. You know, <laughs> it's not that level of, of, uh, of hobby. Um, but again, you know, look for, look for, uh, pottery studios in your area or potters in your area. They may be willing, um, to supplement their income, uh, by offering, you know, classes or open studio space or something like that, um, when it's safe to do so. So check it out. Um, let me know what else you've been working on. Have you tried any new, um, hobbies or crafts, uh, during this period? Have you, have you either, you know, been in a rut that you're trying to break out of, or have you been, um, trying to find something to do with your, with extra time that you've, that you have? Um, let me know what you've been working on. Thanks again for joining me. Thanks for coming back to the channel. And uh, we will be back um, with at least one video per month from now on. Um, I don't know what my next one will be, um, but I'm sure it'll be something interesting. So thanks again for joining me. Stay tuned. And in the meantime, take care and be well. Thanks a lot.